Hopefully, most anyone who watches this video has already gone out and supported the incredible work of Denis Villeneuve and his team in crafting Dune Part 2. But for those of you who are still on the fence about seeing it, didn't necessarily care for how slow paced the first movie was, or maybe you just aren't sure Denis could really deliver again, let me summarize this entire review for you in this intro section before getting into details. Dune Part 2 stands toe to toe and possibly even surpasses the greatest sci-fi sequels of all time. In many respects, making absolute mincemeat out of movies like Terminator 2, Empire Strikes Back, or even Denis' own Blade Runner 2049. Through a visceral and visual combination of stunning set design, kinetic pacing that'll cause your pacemaker to malfunction, a score composed by Hans with madman-like ferocity, and a host of A-list actors turning an indie movie level like energy in their performances, Denis has crafted the ultimate sci-fi film. It's more of a buzz phrase or a buzz word this, these days to say that a movie has quote something for everyone. And I've already seen a few people saying that about part two, whether it's like a casual reviewer on IMDb or like a professional reviewer. And I just completely disagree with that statement. Like, I think that it's a film far more palatable than the first one. Like, Denis kind of mentioned in an interview that he was having a sit down with uh, Christopher Nolan on the IMAX YouTube channel. He mentioned that he wanted this to both feel like a movie that was a direct continuation of what came before, but simultaneously also a movie where somebody could skip the first one, but still feel like they got something out of this one without being too lost. I don't necessarily know if I would say he completely accomplished that, but the fact that I feel like I could show part two to somebody who hasn't seen the first Dune and they would still find enjoyment out of it really says quite a lot. Like I said, it's a lot more palatable, but it does so without sacrificing like the high strangeness, the philosophical meanings, and the raucous action that kickstarted the franchise in the first place. Dune part two isn't more of the same, it's a completely different kind of pacing and delivery, but it sacrificed none of Denis' vision, and frankly no amount of trailer rewatches or YouTube video essays like this one will do justice to what the theater experience really is like. If you thought that Endgame had energy, if you thought that The Force Awakens had palpable tension in the room, you've experienced nothing. This movie was practically two and a half hours of the entire audience in a packed IMAX theater being damn near silent and holding their breath as the film just bombards you with sensory moments after sensory moments. And if that didn't convince you, maybe this next section will. We gave them something to hope for. That's not hope! Thy knife chip and shatter. So Dune Part 2 starts off quite literally almost directly after the first film with maybe like a few minutes here and there with Paul and his mother, Lady Jessica, traveling through Arrakis' sand dunes alongside Stilgar and Chani as they go to find the Fremen strongholds. Soon afterwards, they're ambushed by Harkonnen forces who are still hunting down the last remnants of resistance they can find in an effort to regain control of the spice fields after the events of the first movie. After Paul, Jessica, and the Fremen dispatch the Harkonnens in a dizzyingly visual spectacle, the Fremen move on to the siege, and so begins Paul's next steps in becoming the fabled Lisan al Ghaib. But does he really believe in the prophecy, or is it all just an elaborate scheme set up by people far older and far smarter than he is? And while Stilgar may be quick to believe, Chani and the other Fremen aren't so quick to accept Paul, and his mother will have a much bigger say on it than ever she could have imagined. But rising fanaticism also means a rise in tension, and rumors of Paul's survival are beginning to circulate amongst the Harkonnen, and the news slowly drips its way back to the royal family of Emperor Shaddam and his daughter, Princess Irulan. So will the Harkonnens continue to play their hand effectively and regain the immense wealth of Arrakis? Will the Emperor become so infatuated with the idea of control and dynasty that the mere rumors of Paul are enough to displace his throne? Does Irulan see this as all an elaborate game set up by the Bene Gesserit, or more a series of tragic events gone awry? 
All of these are questions posed by Dune Part 2, but I don't really want to spoil how any of them play out. Like, I know a lot of people have read the books, but a lot of people are also new to this world. But I do also just want to mention how effectively Denis expands on characters who had minimal screen time in the first movie, while simultaneously being confident enough to remove some screen time from others, and never once making it feel as though anything was sacrificed to make those choices. I'll start with Stilgar, because Javier Bardem fucking owns this role, and I was so incredibly satisfied with how much more time Denis gave him to flesh out this idea. See, Stilgar is a believer in the prophecy of the Lisan al Ghaib, but he isn't immediately convinced that Paul is that messianic figure. Now, over the course of the next two and a half hours, though, we watch as Stilgar slowly transitions from weary, sort of, you know, battle-hardened man to this enthusiastic teacher who has this new pupil to take under his wing to becoming a fervent zealot of Paul's who will wage a holy war for him at the mere drop of a hat or a, uh, just a simple sentence. Shai Hulu decides today if you become Fremen or if you die. Stilgar's infectious personality isn't just because of Bardem's charisma, even though he pours into it, but because of how human he feels as a character. Like, it's easy to poke a finger at him and scream, Zealot, but he sums it up beautifully in perhaps the most hard-hitting quote of the film for me. I don't care if you believe, I believe. Cementing that, at the end of the day, who cares if the Lisan al Ghaib is real, or that it's even Paul if it is real. What matters is what Paul stands for, and what he does for the Fremen. But seeing how that power will be used through the eyes of Stilgar's enthusiasm is tragic and heartbreaking by the time that the credits roll. And speaking of Fremen, Chani gets way more of a chance to shine. She's actually in more than 10 minutes of the movie. And this might be the first time since Euphoria that I genuinely enjoyed a performance by Zendaya. Even though I don't really like Euphoria, Zendaya is a shining star in that show. In this movie, she brings a very nuanced portrayal to the screen for Chani, being you know, both enraptured by Paul as a personality, but incredibly weary of anyone that seems to be wanting to use the Fremen rather than liberate them. See, to Chani in this movie, Paul isn't a savior, but she desperately wishes that he could also be the one to kickstart a rebellion to bring Arrakis back to what it once was. But as her emotions begin to cloud her logic and she falls in love with Paul over the months and months he trains with Stilgar, the true tragedy of this whole story really starts to come into focus. Can she put aside that love in an effort to see Arrakis free from control? And if so, what caveats will come in place of that? Is she ultimately just seeing out one ruler for another? And if it isn't meant to be Paul, then what was the point? She also serves as an excellent juxtaposition to Stilgar as she doesn't see the Lisan al Ghaib as anything more than a Bene Gesserit plot to maintain control over a people who have long been subjected to them. But the true horror of that is that she doesn't really have doubts because she sees through the lies of the Bene Gesserit per se, but rather because she doesn't see any immediate proof of the inverse being true. It's almost like in a really sad way, she almost wants to believe, but she just can't because the Bene Gesserit will never free Arrakis. So why would the Lisa al Ghaib? Speaking of the Bene Gesserit though, Rebecca Ferguson delivers a sinister and chilling performance as the evolution of Lady Jessica begins to come full circle. I can't really expand on that by much, but seeing the degradation of her loving and doting nature in the first film to this more lurking in the shadow style of persona is actually genuinely frightening at times. I had my doubts that Ferguson would deliver knowing how Jessica evolves from the books, but I was pleasantly surprised by how well she owned this role. And before I talk about some of the supporting characters though, in terms of owning roles, if you had any doubt about the fact that Timothy Chalamet was going to fully step into the boots of Paul and deliver on what people expected from the character, let me assuage, 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 let me assuage your doubts right now. For the first, like, hour of this film, Timothy Chalamet continues that sort of, like, nuanced portrayal of a young person who is really just sort of overwhelmed by everything that's happening in his life. I mean, he lost his father, he lost everything that would have come with that, you know, pretty much all of his friends, his forces, everything has been decimated. All that he has left is himself and his mother. And there's already a widening gap between the two of them because whether it's Jessica's continued devolvement into becoming a Bene Gesserit Reverend Mother, or whether that's because of Paul's visions becoming increasingly more tangled inside of their own logic and starting to mix and match between these different realities, there's this overwhelming sense of 
just, I've said it before, but just tragedy with the character of Paul. And again, to anybody who's read the books, that's probably going to fill you with a lot of hope for where this story is going to go. And just for the first hour, you just really feel kind of sad about it because Timothy Chalamet does such a good job of portraying this character who just desperately wants to like, despite everything that has happened, he simultaneously wants to do right by his father. And even if there's, you know, sort of this belief that his father didn't, you know, want to, wouldn't want him to seek revenge, he just can't let things go. He still has to find some way to strike back at the Harkonnen, some way to strike back at what was taken from him. And whether or not that involves the Fremen and his mother, at this point, he's not entirely sure that he cares. But then you introduce the characters of Stilgar and even more so Chani, and he's starting to see this sort of more nuanced idea of what he can really do. Through Stilgar, he sees an opportunity to learn a new type of warfare and a new way of thinking. And to him, he can see that as an opportunity to grow as a leader, to grow as a warrior, and to use his combined knowledge of Harkonnen tactics to convince the Fremen to come with him on sort of this campaign to retake Arrakis from them. And it's all based in this idea of, you know, logic and tactics and planning things through. And through Stilgar, he sees an opportunity to do that. And that whole time, it's because he also doesn't believe in this prophecy of him being the Kwisatz Haderach or even, you know, the Arrakis prophecy of him being the Lisan al -Gaib. He just sees these opportunities as something more real, something more grounded in reality. But then through Chani, he also has to deal with this incredibly unexpected thing in his life where despite having these visions and being confused about who this mysterious woman is in his dreams, he then meets this person that he wants to fall in love with, and over the course of months and months, he does, and it becomes something that tears him away from these different ideas, because now he's conflicted and being pulled in essentially four different directions. He's being pulled in one direction by Stilgar, who desperately wants to believe that he is the Lisan al Gaib, but he doesn't believe himself to be, but believes that Stilgar still poses a valuable, tactical suite of knowledge. Then he's being pulled in another direction, which is his love for Chani, and just wanting to have, you know, arguably a regular life or at the very least a regular relationship despite all the complexities and issues that living on a rockets would bring with that then he's also being pulled in a third direction by his mother who wants him to not only utilize what he's learning but to also wrap that into these prophecies and these lies spread by the Bene Gesserit in an effort to really 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 push a campaign that you know at this point in the film and the story just Paul just doesn't believe in he just doesn't see a reasoning for it and he actually quotes in the movie as being heartbroken by what the Bene Gesserit have done to the Fremen and Arrakis as a whole. But then you also have a fourth direction that is being pulled, which is these encompassing visions where in the first movie just outright frightened him. And in this movie, you're starting to see where he's starting to get a little bit more comfortable with this notion, but now he's also becoming more and more confused because he's seeing visions from realities that aren't going to happen or realities that he's not entirely sure are going to happen. Hey, I'm here, I'm here. It's been a while since you've had one of those nightmares. Tell me, what was it about? Sometimes they're horrific, sometimes they're reassuring, but then the further into the movie we get and the more involved he becomes with his mother, the Bene Gesserit, Stolgar, and Chani, the visions and their meanings start to bleed over into each other and you start to wonder how many of these visions are really Paul's and how much of them are being hijacked by people of higher power that just know how to manipulate him. And this idea of being pulled in these four different directions and with so many of those directions encompassing different parts of his personality and what he wants to achieve, you just get this tremendous sense of weight from Chalamet who is just encompassing all these different ideas and all these different directions and he's doing it so confidently and so convincingly that you you just absorb it in such a natural like photosynthetic kind of way where you don't even really necessarily realize it but then when those big like heavy chapter closing kind of moments happen you just sit there and think back on the last like you know 20 minutes of movie that happened and you go holy fuck I didn't think that was actually going to happen. This all this all makes total sense. And I think you really can't see any better than by how Denis takes a lot of the visions that you saw in the first movie and bastardizes them to then showcase the kind of person that Paul is becoming and the direction that he's going to end up taking. I won't spoil it, but there is a moment about, I'd say about an hour 45 into this movie, maybe a little bit further, maybe a little bit less, depending, I, I can't really remember. Paul's character transcends to the next step. You will know exactly what I'm talking about when it happens, and it is 
frightening and it is incredible and the switch that Timothy Chalamet makes in his acting, the way he carries his character, just the physical imposing nature of Paul and just the emotional domineering that he then displays is such a tonal difference, but not tonal whiplash. You see it coming. He who can destroy a thing has the real control of it. You're hoping it's not coming. And when it does, you're horrified. I cannot praise Timothy Chalamet enough for this role, and I hope to God this movie does well enough that we get a closing chapter in the guise of Dune Messiah, which Denis has said he wants to do, because holy shit, I need more of Timothy Chalamet as Paul Atreides. He is incredible in this film, and he should be a front runner for awards season, bar none. Moving on, <laughs> moving on from Paul and that huge glowing amount that I just gave to Timothy Chalamet. Uh, similarly, Dave Bautista, Austin Butler, and Skarsgård all give excellent performances as Raban, Fade Ratha, and Baron Vladimir, respectively. I mean, all three of them are like different styles of psychopaths. Like, Raban is vocally violent and akin to a human battering ram. He's effective in his own right, you know, but woefully unsuited to a multitude of tasks that require anything more than sheer force. And yet he's unable to see anything but the breakable gate in front of him. And it shouldn't really come as any surprise to anyone who's kept up with his career, but Batista fucking owns this role and his vicious physical presence makes every scene with him just this nail biting one as you wonder how well he'll react to fucking anything like i loved seeing batista embrace his villain arc and i felt like he definitely was teasing us a lot in the first movie about just sort of how he was going to encompass his character in the follow-up and let me tell you um he encompassed him raban is fucking scary and i loved him <laughs> But if he was scary, um, Fade Rotha is downright fucking terrifying. Austin Butler, I mean, he's quickly making a name for himself, you know, I don't need to tell you that. And while, I, I, I'm not gonna lie to you, I remain a little unconvinced of the hype, he is unrecognizable as Fade Rotha. And not just because of the makeup and the wardrobe. Like, he lives up to Irulan's summary of him as psychotic. And whether it's the incredible arena fight on Gaty Prime, his outburst at Raban, or his final showdown with Paul, he just exudes sinister energy that permeates every frame that he's on screen. I may not really be on the Austin Butler hype train, I'm not out here glizzing him up or anything like that, but I gotta admit, man, uh, he sold me on Fade Rotha, 110%. I mean, Skarsgård is still great as the Baron. I don't really need to expand on that. He doesn't really get as much screen time as he did in the first movie, but he gets some very satisfying story beats and he still gets some chances to shine and he's still just as intimidating as he was in the first movie. It's Skarsgård, man, of course he is. And if you were hoping that screen time wouldn't really be an issue for Florence Pugh or Christopher Walken like it was for Javier Bardem and Zendaya in the first movie, you will be disappointed. Both of them turn in excellent performances, but they're really not in the movie all that much. I mean, seeing as how naturally Denis transitioned those first two, those second two people, Javier and Zendaya, from the first movie to having much bigger roles in part two, I don't really see Irulan and Shaddam's overall absences as indicative of not enough runtime, but rather as Denis just understanding his audience's maturity and intelligence to follow that this is not the last we've seen of them. And come part three, there is no doubt in my mind that Irulan will take center stage and Denis knows that. It really speaks to how much his cast and crew trust him that Denis manages to convince these massive names in the talent business to be in like 10 minutes of a three hour movie and have less than a hundred lines because it'll pay off. Like it's an outrageous amount of confidence that results in nobody feeling like they upstage the other and that confidence also creates a damn good cast of characters that feel really believable despite the sci-fi setting. This world is beyond cruelty. You've been fighting the Harkonnens for decades. My family's been fighting them for centuries. And what a setting it fucking is. Holy shit. Greg Frazier is no stranger to incredible shots, and while everyone, including myself, has sung his praises, and rightly so, 
for his films like Rogue One, The Batman, series like The Mandalorian, Dune Part 1, and The Creator, this is his best work yet, and I will not be shocked if the Dune franchise snags back-to-back -back Oscar wins for best cinematography. And this is coming from somebody who thinks that the cinematography in The Batman was like the best that I had seen in the last like 5-10 to 10 years. But Dune Part 2 just takes a fat shit all over that film. What? Frazier's abilities to make even like mundane movements like tracking vertically as Harkonnen soldiers like hover up a cliff face, the transition from black and white on Gaty Prime, or the emergence of a massive sandworm into a crowd of Sardaukar, everything looks fucking epic. And I hate that word. But the scale of it all is massive, imposing, and at times like downright intimidating. The lived in and physical feeling of the first film CGI has carried over beautifully into a much bigger world and film that feels more alive than ever. And Frazier's incredible shot composition will keep your eyes glued to every delectable frame. I gotta quickly like go back and like kind of expand a little bit on the Gaty Prime sequence. I don't want to I don't want to say too much because I honestly think you just need to experience it because I can't really I can't I can't do it justice. There was a part of me that was kind of concerned that the Gaty Prime sequence because it was shot in black and white. I was kind of worried it was going to take on this tone of like, you know, trying to jump on this this trend of like, you know, big name directors and like kind of like, you know, transitioning back to this idea of like marrying black and white to like, you know, color film. And, and even though I knew that that really probably wasn't the case, there just there just there was a part of me that was concerned that it just wasn't going to translate very well. Um, I was dead wrong. It's not even so much that the, these sections are shot in black and white because they're kind of not <laughs> but like the way that like get the the son of gaty prime like creates these different like color combinations and contrasts is fucking incredible like my mind was blown at how they were editing these things together and how they were showcasing different sort of like liquids and fabrics and textiles and shit like that to look a certain way because of the way that the sun shines on Gaty Prime that I was sitting there just like mesmerized by the entire thing like how did they do this like I just need like a two hour breakdown behind the scenes of just how they edited the Gaty Prime sequence because I need to know I need to fucking know how they did this because it looks so fucking cool and it looks so believable and so sci-fi and epic and high strangeness it's just so fucking good there's one shot in particular it is the most simple shot and it is my favorite of the entire movie there's Bene Gesserit who are in these stark black robes walking through a hallway that isn't bathed in the sun so it's like in color and then they you know transition into like sunlight in the arena and you kind of see like you know the color like bleed out of the frame you're like oh yeah that's kind of cool it's going in like it's black and white but then because the way the gaty prime sun works it turns black into white for certain fabrics so then they transition into the sunlight and you go from color to no color to an almost like thermal color where the robes turn from black to white in like one seamless shot it is the coolest fucking thing i've seen in the movie and when you see the movie you'll be like dude you were right like i said arresting is the best way to put it but it's it's also not just going to be your eyes that are arrested and transfixed but your ears as well what if paul atreides were still alive A lot of people love to mention how like insane the sound design has been for Dune and it, it, it's just as good in this movie. Like it's just as incredible as the first film and there's a lot more use of like things that I think a lot of people were kind of hoping for from the first movie but understandably we didn't really. Like a lot of the battles you know are just like swords and grunting and like choreography. This film has, you know, physical guns, it has las guns, blades, variations on soundscape and soundtracks, and like just the way that everything sounds and just the kineticism to it and just the punch that everything has is really fucking well done. Everything just has this weight to it, like the whole world, everything just has just this like physical feeling to it like when a gun is lifted you feel like you're lifting the damn thing you like feel your biceps fucking flexing when a character hefts a weapon when 
a last gunshot goes off you feel your heart skip a beat where you're like shit i wasn't expecting that to sound like it did when an explosion rocks the entire movie theater you sit there gripping your hand seat like holy fuck i felt that through the screen that's just how good the soundscape editing is in this movie God, the soundtrack is just like a constant eargasm. Like Hans Zimmer's score is obviously no surprise that it's of high quality, but it might be like his most unhinged sounding soundtrack yet. Whether it's like these really haunting melodies of like the Harkonnen Arena, the mesmerizingly soft notes of tracks like Beginnings or Such Delicate Times, or the bombastic epicness of Lisan Agaib, everything in this soundtrack is stellar. And once again, I will not be surprised if it snags Hans yet another Oscar for his mantelpiece. If you're tired of me just glazing Denis' artistic prowess, there are a couple of things that I think should have gotten uh, maybe just a little bit more attention, and one character in particular that I wish just had more screen time rather than being relegated to just a minor plot point. Now first off, there are some rather egregious parts of ADR not being synced up to the scene correctly. Like in particular, there's a couple of scenes with like multiple Fremen characters sitting on a dune hillside as Paul walks away to like attempt riding a sandworm. And some of the like background chatter and like immediate line delivery is just not at all indicative of what the characters are doing and how their mouths are moving. Another time I noticed was when Chani is sitting on a hill with Paul and there's like this wide two shot where she has some lines and Zendaya's mouth either isn't moving at all or it's not in sync with her lines. Now overall, those are minor complaints for a three hour movie, and I'm sure similar instances are probably present in the first movie, I just think it was worth stating here. Secondly, um, I really wish we had just seen more of Margaret Fenrig, played by Leah Sidhu. I know the majority of people, you know, her role is more than sufficient for the majority of people who are going to see this movie, and it wraps up pretty nicely and sets the stage for part three. But if you know the books, then you know that Margot has a much bigger role, at least in the beginning. And it just would have been nice to have at least gotten some of that, either in a vision, a flashback, or some dialogue between her and the Bene Gesserit, maybe. Like, I mean, Denis knows better than I do, so if he really thought there was a way to naturally sort of, you know, wrap that into the story he's already telling, I'm sure he would have. So it is a personal gripe rather than a genuine storytelling concern. I just wanted to bring it up nonetheless. I just thought it was kind of strange. I mean, overall, just Dune Part 2 is electrifying. Like, I can comfortably say that you are not prepared for the level of physical, mental, and creative exhaustion that this film just drains from you. It is so kinetically well-paced, exhaustively exciting, terrifically well-acted, impeccably scored and shot that you'll never notice that almost three fucking hours have gone by. By the end of Act 3, you'll be salivating for more. And when you take it in as a whole and think back on how much this film made you feel at times with nothing more than visuals and spectacle, you'll be amazed and flabbergasted that human beings are even capable of this kind of filmmaking. Denis utilized a budget to such perfection that it blows my mind. Like the scale of this production and these sets that most filmmakers would balk at, and he makes it come off so seamless and effortless that you'd be forgiven for thinking that it was all practically shot. Like you finish this movie and you're like, yeah, no shit, there's probably a sandworm in fucking like Sahara Desert that Denis just wrestled out of the ground. That's how real this all fucking feels. Like. He understands this process so naturally and effectively that it just makes all other filmmakers look bad by comparison. Like while Nolan has mastered the art of like the high thinking blockbuster with films like Oppenheimer and Inception, Denis has mastered the art of the high feeling blockbuster. It won't leave you confused like Tenet, but it will leave you exhausted like Oppenheimer. Dune Part 2 is not only the Empire Strikes Back of our generation, but it is now the barometer by which all sci-fi sequels, I mean hell, maybe just all sci-fi blockbusters in general should be judged. It is insane what this crew and cast pulled off. I'm still trying to come down from the high of seeing it for the first time. I don't really know if I ever will, and I cannot wait to go back to theaters and see it all over again.